This video is part of a series of videos that I've started creating for Cultivarte in Laredo, Texas. It's a residency that I'm a part of and they do beautiful work uh, helping other emerging artists like myself and guiding us and just helping us create and make. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to accomplish was being more verbal about art and my practice and practicing that side of it. So I thought having a series of talks would do that. And I'm really excited that Emily agreed to be a part of this. My name's Victoria Marcus. I go by Tori. Currently a, I guess like a laser fabricator. I work with laser cutters at Ion Art. I love it. Uh, my old my previous job was working at Blue Genie Art Industries, making those really fun foam sculptures that you see, like torches is one of them. It was a really fun and interesting job. And I learned about sculpture in like really weird, fun ways through that. Um, previous to that, I worked as a uh, Fab Lab proctor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I first started learning like the laser cutters, 3D printers, all that. That being said, I do have a Bachelor's of Fine Art from the University of Texas at Austin, and I've been a muralist since I was about 15, doing like murals for high schools and then progressing to what I've done through the city. Uh, I have one with the city, the city of Laredo in their North Central Park. That is my baby. I'm so proud of it. Uh, I have one with Art in Public Places. Well, it's called Tempo 2D with Art in Public Places this year, and that's coming up, and I'm really excited about that. From Big Murals, I also love doing small-scale work, like the ones behind me. There's something about me creating tiny, huggable, tangible paintings that just, like, makes me feel really fulfilled. I love making little windows to other little worlds using... Um, this abstract process called <laughs> decalcomania. And I just love exploring textures and color. And sometimes I think about scale in a lot of ways and see, viewing these pieces as little windows to worlds and my murals being uh, places that people can envelop themselves into, kind of entering more into that space. Also, this series of the work is a part of the residency that I'm currently doing, where I just wanted to create a school of fish of tiny works that they can all come together and be a bunch of things besides like large just I just wanted to play around with having a bunch of small paintings come together I guess and exploring what that means or what that says um, especially since I do murals and playing with those uh, realms. Thank you for the intro I, I love hearing it because I've known you for years and I still didn't know your whole bio. My name is Emily Lee. I'm an artist in Austin, Texas. I'm from the Texas Gulf Coast, Beaumont, Texas. I previously studied at the Marshute School of Fine Arts, which is a small art studio for a gap year uh, before college. And that was located um, in the same city that Cezanne grew up in and the same city that he painted uh, Mount St. Victoire and so that became a really foundational part of uh, what I was doing at the time and what I still do today even though at the time I was painting from life only and now I don't really do that I do other things so after that I went to school at UT Austin which is where I met Tori and uh, I studied uh, I got a BFA in studio art and a BA with honors in art history and a BDP certificate in museum studies. They all felt very related and very similar to each other. So I felt like I sort of studied one thing really, really deeply instead of like a bunch of things. Since then and during then, I've been working as an art installer and an art fabricator for galleries and just clients, but also doing um, some community organizing uh, as part of my practice uh, throughout that. And my work currently, I, I identify as a sculptor, but my work thinks about sculpture and all of its uh, components like form and scale and gravity and physicality um, and material through totally different mediums such as installation art or curatorial work or performance or even just gathering based stuff. Yeah, and I'm really excited and thankful to be here with you sharing my spiel. So thank you. Yeah, I remember, um... 
back in college, like looking at, cause I was always in the fab lab and a lot of sculptors like yourself would come in and then I would always like go and like see your work. And I remember you did a really amazing one with those. Uh, it was a, a group show with uh, her Instagram is Romo Goth. <laughs> oh yeah, her. Rachel. There we go. I was like, I know yeah, her yeah. Instagram name. Um, and you did those ramens on the floor. Oh and yeah. Like, I was like, this is so interesting. And you always, I, I'm a fan of, um, a bunch of pieces of work that comes together like this and like other um foldable sculptures and you did quite a bit of those and so I was just like oh like so I just wanted to compliment your practice a little bit there <laughs> it's really sweet thank you <laughs> so yeah me and Emily have had little conversations prior to this and the one that I found really exciting that Emily introduced to me was talking about installation and sculpture and all the differences, similarities, nuances between them. I, I was thinking more about this last night, the difference between installation and sculpture. And when I think about it, I always think about a sculpture as something that wants to, that lives somewhere that it's not used to, and it's trying to like figure out mm. itself in that world. And I think about installation as a place mm. that you go into and you almost are that person that's like, ooh, what is this? And exploring that. Um, that's where my mind went. What do you think when you think about these two? I love, I love that read. Um, yeah, I've thought a lot about the different dynamics of, of the semantics between like sculpture and installation. And I, I never thought about that one. Like, <laughs> but that, that totally tracks and feels accurate. Um, so I was studying, uh, I was studying painting and painting just from life. Um, so it was all very predicated, like the school I went to was very predicated on the idea that um, painting from something that you're physically in front of uh, is to paint sort of the air between you and that thing, which is very different than like painting from an image. It's not worse or better, but that's just what the school was like about. So I was like spending this year looking at the air between me and all these things and my professors being confusing being like no paint the air and I'm like okay um <laughs> but they, it got in my brain after a year and I was like oh I get it um and yeah when I came to UT which is a very different very different school obviously because it's like a university and it's huge uh I found myself more drawn to sculpture but for the same reasons that I was drawn to painting, even though I kind of stopped doing painting when I was uh, at UT. And what I liked about sculpture was that it dealt with what we would call like the objective. So it deals with all the things that are like literally in the room. Um, and it deals with like real objects that are actually in front of you. Whereas I didn't feel as connected or like maybe interested in painting and image making at the time because they felt sort of like outside of the room. Like you described it as portals earlier, which I which I like and I, or windows also, which I like. And I think that they do that. And for some reason I didn't want to look out the window. I wanted like, I was drawn to like the type of art that put me in the room. Um, yeah, I wrote my thesis in uh, undergrad my art history thesis is sort of about installation art and like what that whole deal is and uh, at what point an installation ends. If you go to like an installation at any museum um, or gallery and you know you look around you can't really point to the edge of the installation or like where it isn't you can be like yeah I'm in an installation but it's this big vague thing that we like don't really know. So that felt really interesting to me and got me thinking about the differences between the two. I love that you tied a little bit of your experience with painting. And I didn't think about that where, yeah, when you're with painting, you are you are looking out at these things. But when you're with a sculpture, it's almost like you're with another, because it's more tangible. You're with another person. You're living in the space and you are you get to interact and see them and and be more you can touch them. You can't touch paintings. You mm -hmm. can only look at them. Like, mm. I didn't think about that, like how uh, intimate you can get with a sculpture and mm. objects being in a room. 
And I love what you said about what are the boundaries of an installation? Like, is it is it where I visually stop looking at it? And I think when we talked previously, you also say like there's sound, there's time elements, there's all these things. And so if there's a sound element, is it as far as you can hear it? Like, is it outside of that room even that we think it's contained in? When I make a, an installation, like, am I asking myself those questions? Like the boundary of that work? Like the thing about installation art is that I don't think that we could ever find out like what the answer to those things are. And that initially felt really interesting to me when I was at the time at a place where I was like, I'm not a painter. I've always been a painter. And then I was like thinking, you know, you get so self-conscious in art school about, or just conscious about discipline, like discipline specificity. Like, am I, am I in the sculpture discipline? Am I in the photography discipline? And because not only do you have to pick classes that like where you click on a category actually and say, I will make this kind of work for this kind of class, I'll sign up for this class, but also like um, social groups form in relation to disciplines. I mean, maybe because the building is laid out according to facilities, but also maybe just because that's how we socialize with people. Like we form groups around certain activities and yeah, I just found myself in sculpture. I think maybe like junior year, I started really seriously thinking about the differences in media and uh, putting language to it and like writing about it. Like if you imagine a brick in a white wall, normal, fancy museum gallery, there's just a brick in the middle of the room and the wall text in the hallway before you get to the room is like, this is an installation. It's very different than if the wall text in the hallway said, this is a sculpture. And I think that that's a helpful, just visual aid to start to talk about the various like things that plug into that relationship because like an installation in that sense, like the brick itself could be called a sculpture and that's fine. The object doesn't change if you call it an installation. But when we call it a sculpture we think about the brick in terms of like its boundary and it's it has a limit to it and we can point to it and say this is where this piece is and it is kind of as you were saying like it's sort of outside of a context or it's maybe it presents itself as something that's unaffected by its environment and that's a, you know People, artists in the 60s and 70s were like pushing up against that in the same ways that I'm sort of pushing up against it still. Installation art is a really interesting framework to think within today, especially because if you look at the brick and you call it an installation, suddenly you assume that the artist who put it there is has a hand and is responsible for and cognizant of like all of the other factors in the room, like how the light comes in on through the window and like the temperature of the room. And if the brick is in the middle, how people walk around it. And in both instances, there's just a brick in the middle of the room. But if you call it installation art, uh, we suddenly are able as viewers to think about the space and to think about the all of the different invisible factors that are totally there, but just like hard to see and because and hard to name because they're like, something like temperature or like something kind of amorphous and not as as rigid and form based as sculpture it seems it seems to me like when someone calls something a sculpture it's a choice and when someone calls something an installation it's a choice and it situates the work within a different set of parameters the thing that felt most uh, urgent about that thought process to me was the fact that it seems as though we could, as people in general, and definitely in our like political uh, situation, we could definitely spend a lot more time calibrating ourselves to the things that are hard to see, but that are still there. And I think about words that are getting used a lot these days, such as systemic, like we hear systemic racism and systemic oppression, and how are we supposed to see and legitimize and like witness, bear witness to what is systemic if we don't have the means to like visualize it. And I think installation art can be a really good tool to help us visualize like systems and things that are all interacting and entangled 
that are invisible, you know? A hundred percent. I love that you're doing a sort of control group, right? Like they're the same thing. And the only difference is what our perception that we're choosing to have of this object is. Again, like we view it as sculpture, we're like this is this thing, this is what it is. I don't, not that I don't care, but I'm like this thing, um, the brick looks like this, this is what it does, this is who it is. But then when you call it, like you said, when you call it an installation, now you think about everything as, and maybe you're even more empathetic to the brick. You're like, wow, this brick is in this room, it's living in this way, it is interacting with this. I have to, like, I love what you said about the way you walk around an installation, because all of a sudden now you have to, now you have to interact with this brick in a certain way versus if it was a sculpture, just like, oh, I have to go around it because it's in the way. When it's an installation, it's like, oh, this is the space I need to have or the, the closeness I can have with this object and the way I have to walk with it. And we talked a lot about this, like the ties that we can have when we think about stuff in the art realm and applying it to different spheres, like that same frame of thinking. And it's like, if we could look at more things and consider more of those, like you said, those invisible factors, what is our new um, perception of that object? What Now, what are we, what were, what were we not considering before that maybe we should have all because we just went in at it as this is what it is and this is what I think about it and this is. When I think about and wonder why it is exciting to me, I think that it, it feels like it, without changing any material circumstances, it totally opens up and makes porous a lot of uh, what's in the room. Um, and that as, that as kind of a move feels, um, it, it, I mean, it's just been helpful to me when, you know, graduating from art school and trying to like, uh, not work in jobs that I don't like and to just, um, be an artist. And, uh, a lot of that involves sort of like making your own opportunities, um, making opportunities for your friends, which is what you're doing too right now, which is cool. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of communal exchange of opportunities. And when I think about the possibility of just, uh, suddenly realizing that the room is, has been expanded and that it has all of these porous connections and it has a boundary, you know, a work has a boundary that totally depends on like the crowd and it or the viewers and it, it can shift its boundaries and its skin based on circumstances. Like that feels, that feels like a, a parallel situation to the idea of like curating and of trying to expand um, opportunities and, and trying to like show the cracks in uh, the systems that kind of prevent young people from having shows and opportunities and there's a lot of like years that made up that whole jump in my experience. Like I, I didn't like wake up one day and be like, oh my God, installation art is just like all of life. But yeah, it seems like, I, I definitely think that it was sort of like the first part of my practice of trying to constantly make opportunities for myself and my friends and artists who I admire, especially in town in Austin and yeah, they feel, they feel very related to me. I always understood to a certain degree what you were talking about when you were talking about viewing the gallery as, I guess, as an installation and all the things we can't see and all those factors. But now that we've had this talk, I'm like, oh, that really like is resonating now. Like there are things that we look at these objects and galleries and we're just like looking at those face value things like this is there, this is this artist, they curate this people, they've done this, bam, that's it. Versus like you've said, like how did how did it come to be there? Who worked on it? Who are all these hands that were a part of this that are not being seen, but off they had to be there. Like there's no way there is no extra hands and how they are hidden. And you even said um, 
we had in one of the talks that they try, there's like a hiding of those things, like a hiding of uh, the installate and in, installers hands and covering the holes or covering the ways things were put together, hiding that process, but that process is related to the passing of these torch and people to get to that end point. In sculpture, it is, I could be wrong, but a lot of, to me, sculpture is about that end product. This is, I've, I've done this sanding, I've done like, I put all these materials here, da, 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 but the sculpture is this. And this is what I presented and installation has a lot of different like ephemeral and time and process performance. So it is funny that this, a lot of galleries are very much about that end product. Yeah, I definitely, I think, I mean, you and I both have experience being the labor behind artworks, uh, whether of our own or not. And like you working as a fabricator and me working as an art installer slash like gig person. I started working that job at the same time that I started sculpting and at the same time that I like moved to Austin and. And they all, I think that this whole spiel sort of uh, formulated in relation very much to the fact that I was working as, as a laborer whose job was to totally hide all evidence of, of construction in this really beautiful gallery. Sculpture came way before installation art, of course, like so naturally, like, I mean, installation art and performance art and land art responded to sculpture and had all the same like beefs that I have with it <laughs> as a discipline. But I think that installation art today comes with its own like really unique set of problems, like the way that it's commodified really weirdly and, and intersects with like how we look at images on Instagram, like that get popular are the kind that are super, super visual because we learn about them through photos and Instagram and email and, you know, websites. For museums like if they're not visually interesting and in, through a photograph then they in a roundabout way end up losing money if that makes sense um at least for big institutions and yeah so like installation art has its own has its own weird things about it that i don't like support but what i like about just the comparison between sculpture and installation art is sort of just to say that like simply by applying different language and different like a different set of expectations and assumptions on like simply applying that to the world like totally shifts you know the way that we perceive it and the way we perceive ourselves in relation to it like I call myself a sculptor even though I make installations because I want to promote very subtly and no one will notice unless I say this exact sentence but for me I it's to promote the idea that like that something as multi-part and as multi-component and sometimes even outside in the wind, something as like multi-part as that could be thought of simply as one thing, as one little machine working throughout a space. If the machinery has a function, the function of the work, whether, whether it's a sculpture or an installation of mine is like just make people notice their environment. Yeah, it has a lot to do with like multi-sensory presence in the room like not only seeing but also like hearing and feeling and smelling and even having feelings outside of like the five that we have names for because there are tons you know like the feeling of someone watching you is is another sense the feeling that it's a certain time when you don't know what time it is is a sense and the feeling of you know there's like all kinds of different sensations that we have and uh yeah I guess that's just a roundabout way of saying that I in my work I hope to like draw a lot of attention to those senses and to draw attention to the ways in which we are affected and receiving like stimulation from the environment around us and directed and choreographed by that environment I feel like a good way to do that is to call something really complicated and all over the place one thing yeah, and to kind of like make a lot of air between, a lot of space between the different parts. Because really that that empty space is super full. 
a lot of installation considers a, an audience's interaction with it, but the interaction that a lot of people in the audience want to have right now is how do I look in this environment and how will I have, well, how will I be photographed in this environment and show it off. I wanted to tie to like the, the way galleries, or galleries, the way like installation art having to be this like, having to be aesthetically pleasing with all these colors, all these like fun shapes is the same kind of I feel pressure that people are having on social media for their own content, like their content, I feel has to be generated as like, I need to show myself in this like way. I need to show myself as, you know, fun or like aesthetically pleasing or whatever. And galleries, or I feel like the move is everyone's noticing that and creating these spaces for people to, to to make that more of the reality that's happening, which makes it hard for other artists like yourself to emerge because what do you do? Do you start making the installation art that's currently becoming popular, but you wanna stay true to like the things, the, the things that you wanna highlight and strengthen about installation art. And some of these, a lot of these don't do that. And so that being said, um, it is hard to go about and navigate in that space. And, but it is important to continue to create installation art that does like evoke all those, because a lot of these are about fun, which is great, or about, you know, having a good time or, or, or looking like you're in a colorful space, which that's great. But it is great, but having those spaces where, yeah, you, you imagine being in a room that does give you a gut feeling, it does give you the feeling of being watched, or all these like crazy uh, experimenting. Where's the experimenting? Like all these emerging installation art artists should be able to like have those conversations with people. Be like, look, I created this thing. Isn't that crazy that I've created a space that's like eerie, but like there's like this kind of imagery, but it makes you feel this way. Like, and I want to have those conversations. Like why do spaces do this or what I've, I've, uh, I'm trying to think of, um, can you give me an example of, can you help me think of examples of installations that do that, that, that evoke those feelings that are very subtle, but. Uh, I was going to say, uh, Louise Bourgeois is, I don't know if you know her work, but she makes those like really huge bronze spiders um, that are around the world. Uh, and she, but she also makes really weird like steel rooms and like crusty, rusted objects and stuff like that. Um, and they have a lot of times like imagery of distorted figures, um, which is yeah, it's always it's always like kind of a trip. I feel like her work doesn't like deliver um, a good feeling necessarily, but it delivers a lot of feeling, you know, um, yeah. and that we don't have names for. I like, I like work like that, that sort of interrupts or like adds a hiccup to the process of experiencing something and understanding something. Like I like things that slow that process down so I think that there's maybe not enough of that in the world. Overlook feelings that make you really think about it. You're like, oh, what is this doing? Oh, what am I, what am I experiencing right now? The point is, where can that art continue to emerge if it doesn't have the audience right now? You know, can 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 people like confidently go and try and like have this become I mean, because a, a huge, as we all know, a huge part of being an artist is, you know, having to make a living of some sorts off of it and yeah. trying to have, um, I feel like when I did a lot of uh, sculpture and installation in college, uh, I wanted to get as many different people to go experience it, to see and study like what the work is doing. And that's also important for sculptors and installation artists to see like, more of what the audience does. I think there's another piece uh, that this, the name escapes me, but this guy made uh, like a viewing hole into a room. And as more and more people watched it, 
watch through it, like the grease from their face got left and a giant like human stain got left and he left it there on purpose. Like that's an amazing like weird thing, passage of time, like people bodily experience, like that interests me or. Yeah, 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 that is, that is really interesting. Um, I think just in relation to that, like you were talking earlier about or maybe expressing that you felt sort of bad about calling installation art uh, flat. Installation art that uh, has to, you know, live in this world of images. When I try to think about like what artists have work that sort of resists the flattening, like the artist who you just described, who whose work, like the piece itself is partially just this weird grease stain that might happen, might not happen, you know? like they probably couldn't even plan on it happening happening in the museum but it did and like that's now that's now within the parameters of what we call that piece i admire them for that and but it is sort of uh I, idealistic to think that simply thinking things differently makes them different for people um because you know like the reality of the fact too is that like not everybody has uh, a supportive community around them of artists who are willing to like see weird stuff. A lot of people don't have just the institutional access that it requires to like be able to, you know, conceptualize all your problems and just think about them differently. For the viewers of whoever watches this and makes it towards the end, um, I want to like use that as maybe a prompt I think that within the resources that we are forced to have, which is oftentimes not a lot, um, like we don't have gallery space, we don't even necessarily have like enough private space to invite friends to come see your work. You know, there's a huge lack of resources with facilities, especially after leaving school, which whether you went to art school or not, having facilities it makes all the difference. And oftentimes we're not prepared to not have them. I think that within the means that we have, there are a lot of possibilities for making opportunities for yourself and the people around you that also sort of like resist the flattening of, of like how the art world works or like how like exhibiting your art or being an artist works. There really isn't, it, it's just, it is just a very big porous amorphous thing. And there's a lot of room, I think, to, to make it up. Like it's constantly just being made up by the people who partake in it. And just like any other thing. One of the projects that my friends and I did, I co-curated with an artist who's my friend named Henry Smith and a, curator, a nomadic curatorial platform called Partial Shade uh, run by Rachel Starbuck, Michael Mulehaupt and Jesse Klein. And then they were being hosted by a different gallery called Collab Projects, which is run by like 5,000 <laughs> awesome people, too many to name, but for this project, we had an empty field and we proposed this curatorial model of just asking like 15 to 20 artists slash art historians who we knew and liked to exhibit their work as a solo show within individual cars. Like there's so many cars in Austin and there's not enough, maybe like gallery spaces or spaces to call an exhibition space um so what if we just like called a car an exhibition space and we parked all these cars in a parking lot and we like made a really nice pamphlet from flat pack publications which is my friend connor's uh project who you interviewed earlier you know like what if we just made up all of the legitimacy around this thing and you know even the entity who was hosting us which is collab like they were once just a group of friends who also made up their organization uh and partial shade also just you just make it up and um you know you have resources oftentimes to do so but even when you don't i think that there are like there's some mental gymnastics that you can do to try and like make make show opportunities and even if it's not for um for like exhibition I think that it's just important to sort of like plug and prompt people to think about the things that they feel like are missing from their creative practice or having people see your work every now and then, like 
make up an email subscription list and just email your work to people or like have your friends over to a park and like show each other your work there or whatever like there's all these ways of uh of sort of forcing yourself to be seen within your community of artists and i feel like artists are as by trade are so down to um support and like participate in each other's work and i think like we can really like spend our energy like just making things up together because there's enough of us <laughs> i love that you i'm so happy that you brought that up thank you so 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 much yes as much as um it is important to really think about the access people have to these kinds of things and that being said like even when i was um when i was younger living in laredo you know i was trying to you know be an artist and trying to like hang out with other artists and have these conversations and it was like sometimes a little difficult because I was in school and then I would have to go home and do like all these other things so I didn't have like the time that I wanted when I was in high school so I like moved to art school and then I was very like um me personally I was kind of a little shocked at like this this the the art speak and all that and I was like oh my gosh am I not an artist do I not fit in like what do I do is this not gonna work for me I can't think in these these realms and I was a little I was me personally was a little scared at first you know over time I got to build that community with my peers and everyone and then when I got back to Laredo I was super thankful that more resources popped up in Laredo I think Laredo has seen that the art scene like both of our, this residency being one of them um, Laredo Center for the Arts, there's a poetry slam, and they were made by people in Laredo that also were in the same like mindset that I was like, I was in that mindset that like, okay, if I wanted to be an artist, I was gonna have to leave this town, which was a very like sad thought to have. And I feel like a bunch of communities and people in Laredo felt that way. And they're like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna bring it here. They got together and did all these things and started making these spaces but I like that you also said like if you want to take that initiative like you don't have to do something as crazy as take out like a 200 like a huge loan and try and make something like super grand or you don't you don't need to do it quote unquote the right way because there is no right way and I love that you said like start a subscription start like these or even the the gallery, the transmission one that you all did was an amazing way to like tie those things in. So you can, within like your own comfortability, you can do like the steps that you want to bring more art to your community and be proud of those little steps because they are making a difference and they are making a change and more people will do it and more. That's how these things end up working out. That's really wonderful to hear about. And I think I really, dig and and admire that you you know as an artist that was from Laredo and then went to school in a different city you find yourself at a residency in your hometown again which I think is cool because you know the places that we spend time the time that we spend there is like an investment and we are affected by the place that we're at and I feel sort of a responsibility to to like soak it in while I'm while I'm in a certain place and uh yeah I think it's great that like that you're working with those same institutions and small like organizations in Laredo as like an adult artist you know I think that that's like a cool that's a cool model for what is progress in your practice there's the idea that like if something isn't working for you then you like leave to the place where you can find a better version of it and yeah i'm interested in the idea of just of staying where you are for a second actually like me in austin and like learning about all all of it you know all of the intricacies of that place and staying connected to it in the small school that i went to before ut i was like crits were so fun it was like so, we would just like hang out and it was great and everybody looked forward to it and then, yeah, in, in, you know, a university setting a crit is, it functions much more like a test. 
it's not it's not a very circular conversation and that just felt like such a bummer uh but because at the same time like this room that we're all in uh is comprised of like 10 to 15 young people who chose while they were in high school to go to art school and to do that whole thing and like justify it all the way up to the point where they find themselves in this room and i don't know you know it just feels like a missed opportunity to not try and cultivate within that group of people who find themselves all together relationships and practices together that help us make work and continue to make work and be artists if we don't have like facilities or space or or whatever to show work like we have relationships and those can do a lot in helping us like continuously justify being artists even when it is uh not easy and not encouraged like for me like I, again like when i came over and was exposed to all these like ideas and theories and all that and crits i was <sighs> Cause there's this like feeling that you have to present something super finished and super done and super, and then you have to talk about it. Like you have everything yeah. figured out, but you don't, <laughs> and that's okay. And there's, there was that pressure to be like, or even for me, like sometimes the pressure of like, whatever I created was a direct reflection of me as a person sometimes. And that was a lot. And so it feels like a very very rigid like honestly very masculine individualist understanding of like what you present in crit like i don't want to be like that as a person like i don't want to always feel like i have to be a finished version of myself to present to the world and similarly like i you know i want to be able to like show work that is bad and i want to be able to mess up <laughs> <laughs> I want to see bad work and medium bad work and like complicated work and work I don't like but that you know later I learned to like like I, I want you know I want there to be so many more spaces for things that aren't uh that aren't totally vouched for by like five institutions before they like make it to the viewer like just calling it something else meeting at a time but but we would meet in uh I should have said this earlier Crit Club was just a, a critique group that happened after school that we organized um, uh, when I was an undergrad. And yeah, uh, we just met on Fridays in the same classroom in the same building that we would have critiques uh, in at school. But, um, you know, we brought breakfast snacks and like hung out and bean came and it, and there was no time limit um and we like checked in with everyone in between critiques to be like okay it has the energy and like you can leave whenever you want that was that was an early attempt at sort of just reformulating the things that are already there do you have any ending thoughts about every do you have a way to sum up it? there's no <laughs> <laughs> contact me when i'm like 85 and have maybe <laughs> put my life's work somewhere in words i don't know I feel like we covered so much of so much of what I find really interesting and I I appreciate that you're just making the platform for these conversations that's awesome and uh and I I'm really thankful to have been asked to participate truly I'm very thankful that you uh made some time to do this with me and it was really fun I had a really great time talking and it was really special appreciate you